from Connecticut, because that's really where it all began. I'm Dee Petri, President and CEO of the National Association for Olmstead Parks, and we're really pleased to welcome you all tonight. We are the managing partner of Olmstead 200, the bicentennial celebration in 2022 of Olmstead's birth. Uh, tonight's program on Olmsted and Vox Seaside Park is just one of a series of programs we're offering throughout the next two years. And so I urge you to visit our website, olmsted200.org, and the national calendar regularly in order to stay up to date on ever-changing programs and tours. The Bicentennial is, of course, about celebrating but even more, it's about inspiring efforts across the country to sustain and in some cases, revitalize and rethink Olmsted parks and landscapes. Frederick Law Olmsted had more than 500 commissions and many of them are special gems which have been neglected over time. Olmsted understood that these places are not luxuries, they're critical infrastructure, serving as democratic spaces as well as promoting physical and mental well-being. It's with those values in mind that we're pleased to showcase one effort tonight to rediscover Olmsted in Bridgeport. Our speakers are two exceptional individuals, Barbara Geddes and Nancy Hampson. Barbara leads her own architectural and planning practice in Southport, Connecticut. Raised in Brookline, Massachusetts, she became an Olmsted fan early, starting with a summer internship focused on Olmsted at the Boston Museum of Fine Arts. She graduated Phi Beta Kappa from Vassar and holds a master's in architecture from the University of Pennsylvania. With over 30 design awards, Barbara was the first woman architect in Connecticut to be elected to the AIA's College of Fellows. Nancy Hampson is the System Director of Community Health Improvement for Yale New Haven Health. She oversees health improvement planning for the system's five hospitals, focusing on social determinants of health. She holds a BA in psychology and an MBA in healthcare management, and she is an American College of Healthcare Executives Fellow. These two speakers are going to introduce us to the history of Seaside Park, recent developments, and how city leaders and a wide array of organizations and individuals are exploring ways to reimagine the Bridgeport waterfront and Seaside Park to foster physical and mental health. Those of us who've been involved in such projects know that they take years and offer many challenges and opportunities, but you can't start without a vision. So we are excited to hear how this Olmsted Park is inspiring community members to collaborate and think big. We'll listen tonight to the presentation for about 40 minutes, and then I will take questions from the chat box. We will be taping the presentation this evening, so please turn off your video and audio if you do not want to be recorded. And kindly put yourselves on mute. And with that, Barbara, the screen is yours. Thank you, Didi, and thanks to you, Nancy, for being here with me. And thanks to all of your wonderful faces. I know a number of you, it looks like. I know some of your names, so welcome. So let's look at the first slide, uh, Victoria. So could you put the first slide on? Why do we have to rediscover Frederick Law Olmsted at Seaside Park? Most of us already know that Olmsted and Vox appeared at design in 1867, the same time they were deeply involved in Brooklyn and Prospect Park, but with meager primary sources and charming but inconsistent secondary sources, we still have much to rediscover. This wonderful context drawing on the right is the singular must pub publish source of the design. It is not an Olmsted and Vox drawing to be sure, but is instead the Frederick Beers Atlas. We'll go back to that many times this evening. There's much to tell and much, many stories in that drawing. The center of this year long celebration is about Olmsted, a life worth celebrating, a vision worth reimagining, a design grasp that understood public service. But tonight we examine his lifelong sense the public open space and the public park within a brand new city like Bridgeport uh, might indeed affect physical and mental health. This was a 19th century notion to be sure, but backed up in recent empirical research. One of our collaborators on our core team is here with me tonight, Nancy, whom you already met from Yale New Haven Health. This overview is an ongoing collaboration of many volunteers. This includes two universities, a nearby university, the State University, the major medical center in the region, 
two national conservation associations, including the Nature Conservancy, oh. a regional land conservancy, Bridgeport-based based youth educational organizations, and a local garden club. All along the way, our information has been shared and vetted with the fully supportive City of Bridgeport Parks Commission and Parks Department, many members of the local community, the local South End NRC, that's their planning council, as well as private citizens and private employers. Uh, next slide. Okay. All right. I love this quote from someone not uh, someone from resilient Bridgeport. Bridgeport is a, is a city of five peninsulas. I didn't know that. It's a port city divided by creeks, rivers, low-lying areas with a long and spectacular presence along Long Island Sound. You can see two of the peninsulas here. In 1867, when Olmsted and Calvert Vox were invited by Nathaniel Wheeler to prepare a plan, Bridgeport had only 15,000 residents. Oh this land partially resided within other towns, Stratford to the east and Fairfield to the west. By 1890, Bridgeport had absorbed the lands, uh, these lands from Fairfield, as well as other neighborhoods from Stratford. Its population quadrupled to 48,000. By 1900, 70,000. By 1920, 143,000. 10 times from when they started. There are 158,000 people today and our five town region of the adjacent towns has over 300,000. Now look, well, let's look at Seaside. The original Olmsted and Vox design was a 44 acre walking park. park. Today's Seaside is about 370 acres or 325, depending on which source you use. It's a beach, sports and recreational area. It has lots of access. It's near the university campus. It's near a future high school campus. It is walking distance to the ferry, if you can believe it. It is walking distance to downtown and even to Metro North. And there is lots of bus service to downtown and the university and a bus shelter right at the main gate. But as correctly reported in the National Historic Register designation in 1982, they were perplexed as I was by the many distinctly different parts of Seaside that reflect generally distinct and dramatic interventions. So for tonight, I'm gonna to use four terms that will help your understanding of these four parts, okay? The original Olmsted and Vox section, it's on the far right of the screen, has two sections, east and west of Park Avenue. Seaside East, the far end of the drawing on the right, has its original main street uh, entrance, which is pointing upward on a panhandle. Waldemere Uplands, which is from the Park Avenue arch to Arniston is also part of the Olmsted and Box design. We're going to focus on that today. The third section is the mid, uh, mostly flat section without trees. It's directly west of that. And finally, the beautiful west beaches from reclaimed marshlands extended by a breakwater all the way out to Fairweather Island. It is so much different and so much more, and yet Seaside and Olmsted are still there. Okay, next slide. Next slide, Victoria. Uh, the entrance of today, Park Avenue. This was the secondary entrance in 1867. In fact, this was Division Street. It was the boundary between Fairfield, which would have been on the right-hand side and Stratford on the left. Uh, this was the midpoint, or maybe the two-thirds point of the original park. The Memorial Arch, which is the iconic symbol of Bridgeport, the city of Bridgeport today was installed after World War I in 1918. But I wanna call your attention to this entrance sign of welcome. And I see a lot of Bridgeporters here. So forgive me for reading this sign, but I will, I love reading it. See what it features, the three Bs, Banshell, ball fields and beaches. It notes 1865, which was the date of the resolution to, to create the park when it was really 1867, when the park was prepared. And then our friend Frederick Law Olmsted has his frequently misspelled name, misspelled again. So Jean, you can see that. <laughs> Homestead, S-T-E, like stead, stead. Okay, next slide, please. Uh, so who knew about this beautiful original land before Wheeler brought in Homestead and Vox? The early discovery of the land and its fantastic assets revolved around three salient features. The first was a beautiful grove of trees in the uplands on the Stratford side. It's near where the arch is today. The Bridgeport Standard has many early articles about the growing conversations among several adjacent landowners to donate land for a public park, all of whom agreed 
that this fine natural grove, which was a bit of a holdout in the land transaction, was the essential element. Without it, it wouldn't work. Number two, spectacular views for what became known as Breezy Point. That is this beautiful Hudson River painting of 1867. This was beautiful. The cross breezes that were remarkable. So who, except for the landowners of P.T. and Nathaniel and several others, who even knew about these gems? Well, in 1862, Union soldiers in the 17th Regiment uh, under Colonel William Noble, famous in Bridgeport for other reasons, were here for training exercises. And they brought back stories of the beauty of the wonderful vistas if you could just get through the boulders to get there. So again, here's this painting. Uh, Charles Hunt was training in Brooklyn um, he was 27 years old when he painted this. I somehow think he had something to heard from someone at Prospect Park, you better go up and do this. So I think this, this is a spectacular painting. There are large boulders, lots of gravel, and maybe some of those boulders one can see today in part of the seawall. We'll tell the seawall story later. With private lands, all the boulders and gravel, there was no east-west access. Okay, next slide, please. So this is where the fun begins, a clue. So another clue. So there's someone on this call that gave me this clue and I may or may not tell you who it is. Um, so this drawing of Seaside Park on the left is the same Beers Atlas. And along the bottom of this, um, in one of the, I hope misappropriations, it says Olmsted and Vox, and then it says and Vili. But I decided to crop out Vili. So let me go back. Uh, as you may know, the master list of Olmsted has scant information on the 67 plan. The drawing in only one letter Olmsted wrote later comparing his early seaside to his later design of Beersley Park with his stepson 20 years later. So our team found this early stamped drawing in 2017 in a closed archive of a former Smithsonian Museum of the artifacts from the Harold uh, Wheeler House. This is a very important drawing to me. It's Abner Thomas's civil engineer. It has the Olmsted and Vox stamp on it. I don't know if you can see that on your screen. And seaside was two words, sea. Uh, and this was the topographical map and is beginning grading for the, uh, for the road to the north. You can note two things, the pre-existing grove of trees that had been much touted, and then the pre-existing wet and rocky beach on the west side. Note also, once again, the three entrances, the major entrance in the northeast corner on the left with a great plaza, a little bit like uh, it echoes of Prospect, was East Main Street. The second entrance, bisecting two of Wheeler's own properties, was the park entrance at Division Street, now Park. And the third eastern boundary on the Fairfield side, which took you down to the actual beach, a real beach, no seawall, at uh, Arniston. Nathaniel Wheeler was the landowner in the group who brought in, quote, the artist of New York, as they were described in the Bridgeport newspapers, and hired, he said, for a considerable sum, he complained, Olmsted and Vox. Their plan was presented along the land transfers of Wheeler's and many of his neighbors, including uh, PT, to the new adjacent city as a gift. Okay, next slide, please. So less than 10 years later, there were major changes Seaside was different. The Olmsted and Vox, part one and part two, the East End and the Waldmere Upl Uplands were already transformed. So Bridgeport had annexed parts of Fairfield, it had annexed parts of Stratford. PT became the mayor in 1875, and you can see where Nathaniel Wheeler's lands were. Now you see Waldmere, the home of PT Barnum, on the left hand side of the screen. And, as, and Seaside had already lost several key elements, but to some, it gained entirely new uh, tourist-related elements. So here's Colonel Viel again. He'd been hired by the city to consult on his long-held belief that a continuous seawall was essential to fight back the sea at all costs. This included landfill so that the natural coastline edges were eased, the location for the boat landing from Olmsted and Vox was removed, Olmsted and Vox's beach uh, was filled in and enclosed. Vox's Belvedere, which may or may not have ever been built, was not to be. And most important, with the newest mansion of Mayor P.T. on his expanded property, Waldemere Uplands, maybe one third of the original 44 acres, was now replaced by a trotting park with open vistas through and from the Barnum 
residence. A new reshaped straighter avenue, now renamed, of course, Waldemere, which means woods by the sea, apparently in three German words, and what is now the Marina Park open space. So in the little inset of the trotters racing around the trotting park, there's a funny story that later on, uh, when the car came into Bridgeport and a great locomobile factory came into Bridgeport, they substituted the horses for cars going around the trotting park who would regularly get stuck in the gravel and mud and it would be a bit of a thing, a bit of a problem. Uh, next slide, please. So the centennial of 1876, plus that beautiful memorial that Jean mentioned, an absolutely gorgeous memorial, the first statuary to the park the Soldiers and Sailor Memorial, which is truly stunning, was erected in honor of the Civil War dead, but it was also taught by a figure celebrating the genius of America. And I think at the time, Bridgeport was at the top of its game. Maybe it too represented the genius of America. It was celebrating its major success. It was indeed Park City. It was a hub of industry and invention, entrepreneurs with a burgeoning population. It was also a tourist destination with rail and boat access from New York City. So you see this romanticized drawing. It doesn't really look exactly like Seaside, but you can, you can find the oval, you can find the home called Waldemere, and I think you can still see the great plaza at the Upper East End pointing up toward uh, what was uh, Little Liberia. Uh, let's go to the next page, please. So uh, someone asked, or someone said in a question or a comment earlier when they were registering, they heard there wasn't much of Olmstead left in Seaside Park. Sorry, there's lots. You just have to know where to look. And where you have to look is at the East End. So let's see where we can find traces of Olmstead and Vox today. Here is the genius of place personified. They use the natural assets of the grove, the vistas, the offshore breezes, and the sea to be center stage in this marine park. The Olmsted, as you know, adopted English landscape designer Humphrey Repton's idea of recognizing the inherent genius of a site, the character situation, the place to be improved, including its disadvantages and deficits. I think that's really important in this site. Uh, next, please. Next slide. On the farthest east end of the park, if you look closely today, you can reimagine the many curved pathways and the wonderful trick of Frederick Law Olmsted of offering views, taking them away, restoring them again, and changing the view. Something that I think is remarkable in every Olmsted setting I've ever seen. It's still there, you can find it. You just have to know where to look. Uh, next, please. Uh, so if you're looking for LAs, in 1920, the trees were different, the LA was denser. A um, Couple months ago before the trees budded out, uh, you can find a few, of the, a few bits of these LAs and the layering of texture and materials of the pastoral style. So you can find, you can find if you know what you're looking for. Next slide, please. Breezy Point is no longer the romantic painting that it was because now it has bits of seawall. In, in 1906, this lovely postcard said, back at the old place where the sea breezes flow. Uh, and you see there, you, it, you can see the tide coming in and sand. Uh, today, all of the edge is a seawall. And the trees there, of course, are not the original. The seawall has been reworked many, many times since Colonel Veeley. And we'll talk about that again a little bit more later. So point lookout, um, you see in 1909 and 1920, 1921, uh, there's a lovely walking path near the Spanish, uh, the Spanish can cannon and near where the boats probably did once upon a time come in. So again, it's, it's there. All right, now we, we move ahead. Another giant chapter, 10 years later, 10 and 15 years later, we, we have uh, Barnum having left this life, left a huge legacy. He left Marina Park as land open to the future. He himself was no longer here. Seaside's trotting park was becoming an automobile park. And it was always getting wet in the middle when they had a lot of boys and men trying to play baseball. So uh, in 1883, uh, a drainage pond was dug. And this is marked as an attempt of 19th century engineering with an outlet to Long Island Sound. And that uh, drainage pond has either a very romantic name called Mirror Lake, which is in beautiful postcards, 
or kind of an odd name called Mummy Pond, which is not as pretty. Uh, but in any case, it was in many postcards of the day. And it was, it was considered a, an iconic point in Seaside Park. Once again, you can see on the right-hand side, the east side, the two thirds of the park, you can see lots of the original plan still going. This is part of the saga of the city of Bridgeport, a place of five peninsulas with the sea and the rivers. This is the city of Bridgeport confronting the sea again and again. In recent history, resilient Bridgeport is working with federal funds up in the northeast corner on a major stormwater structure. Uh, let's go forward. So now we want to talk about the Waldemere Uplands today, where the trotting park was, then the locomobiles were, where the drainage pond is, and where there's a bandstand today. This is the area that we've been studying. This is looking toward Arniston, nearly bare of trees today. The balance of the site is curiously a very low bowl now near the drainage pond. We hope that the larger reality of Bridgeport living and dealing with water brings 20th first century ingenuity for a phased and comprehensive vision. Maybe reconsidering all of Seaside as a living landscape buffer offers opportunities that were always hidden in plain sight. Once again, Olmsted and Vox, I think Vox too, had a deep belief that Parkland had other means to improve physical and mental health. But for the moment, reconsider the Waldemere Upland section of the park, part of the original Olmsted and Vox, as a first step in a larger vision. Okay, please go back to the next one. Um, so reimagining the Waldemere Uplands uh, is not intended as a restoration because those, those of you and, and those including myself who sometimes work in restoration, you can't be sure of the longevity of the Olmsted and Vox plan. You can't be sure that someone might not want to restore it to a trotting park or a car, but something uh, that it can be in this century. Waldemere from Park and the Perry Memorial Arch to Arniston is about 1400 linear feet. That's what that little diagram shows. That's not really that long. It's a bit of an elongated bowl shape from its trotting park days, as I said, with the bandstand I mentioned, now a running track is, it appears to be sort of the modern equivalent of the trotting, and there is the drainage pond once again. It has the raised seawall and its south boundary in Waldemere Avenue to the north. It's been used for outdoor concerts and festivals, but unlike the east end with shade and a beautiful tree canopy and a grove, there's no canopy here. So we started to reimagine a tree canopy on the Waldemere uplands over time. Can we imagine this upland incrementally maybe one third, one third, one third with trees, trails, perennial plantings based on Olmsted design philosophy. Could we highlight health and wellness in the tree uplands and reintroduce Seaside as a gateway for health, fitness and recreation for all? Could we imagine a concept that recognizes and acknowledges parks as a living landscape and a broad expression of resilience in our 21st century? And finally, can we incorporate community input and find a concept that might increase park access Park, park appeal and direct impact on community health. Go forward, please. Next slide. Using the theme of wellness, uh, this is an illustration of an Uplands Trail, um, a sketch along Waldemere. This could be something like a first trail concept that would start just west of the arch and extend about a third of the way to Arniston. The idea might be to establish a series of loop paths rambling through a new tree canopy. Uh, creating islands of pollinator perennials that surround a meadow. Um, and it might include plants, it should include, whenever it comes to be and develops in some other uh, time, uh, understory ground cover and trees. It would work in a coastal area that is going to get inundated now and then. You see above, if this 450 foot long sketch is about a third of the distance between the Park Avenue Arch and Arniston. And it leaves intact um, the centerpiece where that today's running track is, which is a request of the city of Bridgeport. Let's go to the next one. So let's talk about trees. So I was listening to the preservation piece on Olmsted today at noon and Lucy Lawless, um, who we've talked to many times over the years, and about how do you select trees? How do you select trees in this kind of a setting? And she said these three things, which I agree with 100%. First, you have to look at trees that have survived all the storms and all the sandies and all the ebb and flow of this 150 plus year history. Then you have 
to look at the thinking about right tree, right place. Um, trees that would be selected for the region and climate and specific site conditions that can withstand a lot. And finally, uh, one of our core tree team, Beth Santa, was able to find Olmsted and Boxes, with the help of the Friends of Prospect, original purchase orders from Prospect Park in the same time frame. And we were very interested and amazed to find Little Leaf Linden, which is in Seaside, the Swamp White Oak, and of course, the London Plain Tree. So this is a matching of history to context to, to survival of the fittest and hopefully come together in a meaningful way with a new tree canopy. Uh, next slide, please. Um, Homestead and Seaside didn't have much understory, let's be honest here. Um, he had beautiful understories in his estates, but in his public parks, at least at Seaside, there's not a lot of evidence of what understory might have been there. Nonetheless, we are looking under the guise of a living landscape. What are some selected native plants, grasses, and sedges that could be used in an uplands, uh, in a redeveloped uplands and canopy? Uh, some of us now are growing some of these under different conditions to see how they fare. It's a trial and error. The list has to be critically curated whenever this concept continues and develops to see what really works. It has to be low, it has to take inundation, it has to be a pollinator and so on. And we all know about how native meadows have to be maintained differently than grass, but they still have to be maintained. Okay, let's go forward. So this notion is within a much broader notion, a macro notion that has been around for a while. Uh, in 2017, the city of Bridgeport itself did a terrific waterfront plan. And they had uh, a concept of linking destinations that would be uh, uh, take an industrial waterfront, public access and recreation, look at the city holistically. I know it's not an emerald necklace, ladies and gentlemen. I'm going to try to call it a blue necklace from East Pleasure Beach to the West Ash Creek. Furthermore, go forward to the next slide. The trust for no, go to the next slide. The trust for public land has taken that same 2017 city of Bridgeport notion a bit further. They have uh, the same kind of notion, but now are showing some of the key dots and amplifying these key destinations. Uh, 24 miles of waterfront is in Bridgeport. I think that's amazing, amazing. Uh, they show existing pathways, planned pathways, proposed pathways, and their own sliver by the river that they'll be working on for the next many years. The Harbor Yard Amphitheater, the ferry landing, which is going to be relocated. The absolutely spectacular and significant Mary and Eliza Freeman houses and the remarkable story of Little Liberia discovered only in 2007 by a gentleman on this call that's gonna become a future resilience center. And finally, Seaside Park itself, in its fullest expanse, including perhaps the conceptual trail that we've suggested as a possibility tonight. So let's go forward. So from the macro view to the micro view, I leave you with these questions. Could a conceptual trail of beautiful trees and walks along the Waldmere uplands as a scalable, phaseable element with a theme of wellness, shade and active walking make any difference to those who visit Seaside Park? Do we believe that parks truly and most profoundly at the largest and small scale make any difference to people's lives? Yes, we do believe that. Do you find that belief embedded in Olmsted's work and life story? Yes, we do. Now let's hear from Nancy of Yale New Haven to explore that further. Nancy. Thank you so much, Barbara. And thank you everyone for the opportunity to speak with you tonight. When Barbara and Wendy and Beth and others first approached Yale New Haven Health, and talked about what they wanted to do with Olmsted Park. Before we even talked about the health and wellness aspects, we were all, we're in, this sounds fabulous. And then once they started talking about wanting to incorporate health and wellness and talking about the background with Olmsted and how this impacts nature and design, we couldn't be more excited to work together on this. I wanted to take a moment and kind of give you a little bit about Bridgeport and put it into perspective about how where you live impacts your health and well being. Bridgeport, Connecticut is one of the most socially disadvantaged cities in the state of Connecticut. It's surrounded by towns that are more affluent than it is, and it suffers from many of those factors that affect health. There's a high level of food insecurity, 
there's not much safe housing, there's issues with transportation, personal wealth is not at a high level, and all those factors come together to have a negative impact on the health outcomes of those individuals that live there. We see a high level of diabetes and obesity, asthma, cardiovascular disease, all these things are taking place in Bridgeport with the outcome of it has an impact on life expectancy in Bridgeport. If you look at that map on the right-hand side, these are different subdivisions of the town of Bridgeport, the city of Bridgeport, and life expectancy in Bridgeport ranges from 73 years up to 80 years. And you might go, you know, that's actually not so bad. But I want to put it a little more in perspective. 84.1 is the average life expectancy of someone who lives in the sixth wealthiest towns in the county where Bridgeport is located. 82.3 is the life expectancy for someone who lives in Fairfield, which is the town next door to Bridgeport. 77.7 .7 is the average life expectancy for someone living in Bridgeport. So what that means is, if you live in Bridgeport, you live on average 6.4 years less than someone from one of those wealthy towns and 4.5 years less than the town next to you, which the centers of both of those towns, Bridgeport and Fairfield, it's only 10 miles distance. And again, that 77.7 .7 is the average, it ranges from 73 to 80. So what does that really mean? If you could turn to the next slide, please, Victoria. What that means is life expectancy definitely isn't at the level of other areas in the towns around where Bridgeport's located. And part of that is because health is impacted by more than just healthcare. If you look at that circle diagram on the right hand side, for someone's health and well being, about 30% of the average person's life is determined by genetics, what you're born with, what you're predisposed to. About 10% is impacted by the health care that you're able to receive. And then 60% of that is broken down into the socio and environmental factors in which you live and how you're able to adapt to them. So we know that a healthy lifestyle includes access to nature, and this really supports health and well being. Yet, when we look at a recent survey in Bridgeport, over a third of people in Bridgeport residents say they exercise one time or less a week. And 43% of those residents said public parks and recreation areas are either fair or poor. So there's not great access there. So when we look at this concept of seaside and a wellness trail, it really has the potential to make a positive impact in the residents of Bridgeport. And this is in line with what Barbara's been talking about, about Olsa's life and his values around having access to the outdoors and the health benefits of nature and walking. It really, the concept of a wellness trail also helps to promote community and health equity. I think for many of us on the call tonight, if you want to exercise or you want to go outside, you might join a gym, you might take a class, maybe do tennis, maybe you'll buy a Peloton for your house. For most of the Bridgeport residents, that's not an option. So the ability to have a park free to them easily accessible where they can go and they can exercise and they can be outside, that's a huge benefit and will have an enormous impact on their ability to be health, healthy and have some great well-being. Next slide, please. So when Yale New Haven Health was first approached about the concept of a wellness trail, and one of the questions they asked is, well, what do you really think we should have there? And at that point, we all took an intentional pause and said, you know what? There are many ways to put this together, but what we really need to do is go talk to the community, talk to the folks who live there and who will be using it and get input from them and find out what they would like. What we want is this to be for the community, by the community. What we did is back last uh, September and October during the pandemic, we did a series of focus groups with various community constituencies students from the university, which is adjacent to the area that Barbara's talking about, um, businesses in the local areas, some of the housing areas there, some of the folks in the Freeman House that Barbara referenced, the um, youth that are involved in the gardening club and the, the association that Barbara spoke about. And we went to them and held a series of focus groups and said, what do you want? What do you need? What would be important for you to have that would make it a place that you would come and use? 
We also did an online survey to try and gather some more information and really put that together to design something that, again, is by the community for the community. If I could have the next slide, please. What we found is what folks wanted were a couple of things. They would like fitness stations, so kind of what you see here, places where they can go and work out, where we'll have signs up there that show folks how to use them. And we're going to have them a couple of different ways. We'll have them in English and Spanish to be sensitive to the needs of folks who live in the area. We'll also have them at a high fitness level and a lower fitness level. So higher being maybe for those university students who are right across the street, lower level being folks maybe who live in the area or work at one of those businesses that maybe want a little lower impact workout. We'll also have benches with low tables, that was important for people, and game tables, places where people can go and play checkers and play backgammon. That was really important for the community to have. Bike racks were important, along with information about trees and plants in the area and some of the history. And what we heard a number of times in our focus groups were, you know, we'd really love to know more about Olmstead. We'd love to know more about the park. We'd love to know more about the Bridgeport history. And hey, tell us about what you're putting in here and what it means, which was great for all of us to hear. And also folks want a charging station. I think, you know, no one goes far these days without their phone and folks want to be able to use that there. So really we looked at putting together flexible amenities that met all of these diverse needs based around that concept of having folks be able to come in and what they need. And we really feel that what we've come up with not only supports that visual that Barbara was showing of a beautiful landscaped area meeting Olmsted's views, but also then have those amenities that meet what people need to do today to increase their health and well-being. And with that, I'd like to turn it back to Barbara to talk more about how this all comes together in the big picture. What has really impressed um, all of our volunteers is the pride that people have expressed to us in Bridgeport and wanting to know more, as Nancy just said, about Olmstead and more about the original park. And they found it utterly fascinating. I was delighted by that because I thought they wouldn't be as interested as we were, but they were. And they were also saying in the busy likes, remember we were talking to people under the under the shadow of COVID, that sometimes you just need to go someplace by the sea to, to drop your blood pressure and get the breeze and take a breath and just say, here I am, you know, here I am in this world. So there's beautiful pictures from the University of Bridgeport. This is on their LinkedIn site and the University of Bridgeport is also being transformed. Um, it has a, a, a new uh, series with universe, Goodwin University and is uh, reopening Full, full board uh, in a couple of months. So what's the bottom line here? We look forward to continuing collaborative discussions with all those that have been involved so far and more in the future so that so many positive elements can come together in this part of Olmsted and Vox's original seaside in the Walled Marathons. It does seem a propitious time for this jewel of seaside in all of its four parts to be highlighted. It seems the bicentennial of Olmsted, post-COVID, this new understanding of what's important in life, maybe this is the time. And we love, we would love to, to shine this highlight on Park City in the 21st century. Here's a quote from Olmsted himself. The enjoyment of scenery employs the mind without fatigue and yet exercises it, tranquilizes it, and yet enlivens it. Amen. Thank you. Thank you, Barbara and Nancy. It was a fascinating conversation. And I think uh, one that really raises a lot of questions as we think ahead in, for Olmsted 200. Obviously, we're trying to draw attention to parks and places uh, around the country and to help them reimagine these spaces. And so to see what you all are doing, I think, is, is a fascinating exercise of one particular uh, park here at Seaside. I know in Boston, uh, similarly, there are uh, Charles Gate and other projects underway. They're re-looking uh, at the infrastructure, which is reaching its 
final years? Are there ways of reimagining that infrastructure to find new parks and park space? So I think uh, Olmsted 200 and the Bicentennial really does provide an uh, expert opportunity for people to be reimagining as we've heard tonight. And so um, I know we have a, a wide array of, of folks on the, the um, discussion tonight and we're welcoming, welcoming uh, questions. How might the seaside, here's one, how might the seaside wellness trail help the revitalization of Bridgeport's waterfront master plan? I'll let you both take that question. Oh, okay. Well, one would hope that the convergence of so many recent factors, uh, both the 2017 Bridgeport plan and the recent efforts of the Trust for Public Land and the collaborations with the Nature Conservancy one would hope, as well as the previous work of Resilient Bridgeport, we're going to come together under this, uh, under this highlighted year and under this lens. Uh, when we were looking to do something, the Parks Commission suggested this part of the site. They suggested right by the arch, which I thought might have been very you know, off limits to them. And they said, that's where people come in. Whatever happens, it should start here. Whatever happens as a gateway, to however, whatever is gonna happen in the future and many things can happen. So everything is newborn here and everything is conceptual. So don't get too nervous about it. It's, it's just starting, but things are coming together that I think in the end, what I'm seeing already, even in the park the other day, I'm seeing this joy and pride in Richwood. And I think if you express that, it can be contagious. And if so many simultaneous factors, all of them have all of them have tall hills and valleys and, and God knows it takes a long time to do anything that's a little bit different, but a lot of things have aligned. And I think this is gonna be a time for Bridgeport this, this decade. And thank you, Frederick Law, for helping to have a very good birthday at the right time. Right, 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 right birthday, right place, right time. And so Nancy, do you wanna answer that as well? I have to say, I think Barbara covered it really well. She's right. There's definitely an increased pride and resurgence in Bridgeport, really looking at putting together some revitalization plans. Um, I think not only all the work that's being done along the waterfront, but there's also been some new companies coming in and we're really starting to see a resurgence all along that area. So another question, as you are conceptualizing how you might uh, work in the park, uh, what are your thoughts about uh, young children and their ability to engage in the park? I'll start and Nancy can add. One of, one of the collaborators is a group from Yukon Continuing Education Group who has a focus on nature deficit dis disorder and a story time program in the Bridgeport Elementary Schools. And she was linked to us because she heard that there was this large group talking about all these interesting things and she she is very, very interested in having whatever happens in the Waldemere Uplands, an anchor for children in story time, a place for children to sit in a circle and look at plants and plant names and without electronics to be together. And this would be one of their walking destinations. So uh, however this evolves in the future, it's very clear that a children's story time element um, is very much um, on the minds of some of the people with whom we've spoken. A safe place, an inviting place, but a place the kids could sit in a circle and enjoy, even if it's tiny. I know there's scale questions that say, well, how could one, how could something so little only a third, how could that make a difference? Well, we'll see, we'll see how it evolves. But there's certainly a very, it was certainly expressed to have an anchor for children. Nancy, do you wanna add anything to that? I think the other piece is as we're talking about some of those fitness areas and some of those things, we're also going to have signage around that talks about children's mental health and children's physical health and give some activities for children to do in a you know in a safe way that we really fully describe what children can do you know stop look up at the sky can you point can you jump three times what can you do and really help engage them along the whole trail so there's things that they can do with their family and could you both address the question of what plans does the city have uh, for this park in this area? Well, the city has, the city parks department has described to us by asking for this particular area of the uplands to be looked at, 
that they have plans at the arch itself to revitalize and restore the arch itself. Um, they have plans to do something different with the track. I think that's a much larger question, but to do something different with the track because there are a lot of running races and uh, many K races that start, begin and end at Seaside Park. They have plans for that. And they, their whole question is if there's something in the uplands of Waldemar, how would that relate? How would that relate to the track as a beginning and end of races? I think that's very important. I do think, I do think those are two plans. The other plan is they replace, they're planning to replace the benches. We had very interesting conversations with them about the kind of benches they're doing in other parts of Bridgeport and whether they wanted something historic um, or something, you know, iconic for Bridgeport today. And they have already been using something of uh, the Kenneth Lynch company not the Central Park bench, but something else. And they're already as, well, as early as a couple of weeks ago, already replacing some of those. There's an awful lot of work to be done. And the edges when Resilient Bridgeport comes in, and I see that they're on the fall too. There, there's going to be some work at the Northeast end that's going to bring an arborist in, which I think will be well welcome. Mm -hmm. um, I'm amazed at some of those London plane trees because they look like they're getting through and they're twisted and turned, but they're hanging in there. Um, and there will be replacement of some trees if there's some, some negative effects. And I think that establishing a tree list, uh, the city of Bridgeport was very happy to have the tree researched and said they would be delighted to have a, a tree list to use in the future. Uh, one of the other collaborators, Groundwork Ridge, Bridgeport, through a grant, installed some additional trees in the old eastern section last week, a couple of weeks ago. So there's a lot of factors who are influencing each other gently. Um, and I think that probably the most maybe important thing to anything that happens in the uplands is the Bridgeport Parks Commission unanimously approved bringing water to the park. Mm -hmm. And you may say, gee, that's funny, they don't have water. Well, they have water for concession at the other end. They have water for near the bathrooms far away, but not for the trees. Mm -hmm. So by, bringing, by installing a water tap to the park, they will have water for whatever happens in the uplands and whatever happens in the eastern section and whatever happens in the newly planted trees on the other side. So I, I find that it's, there's a lot of, um, I don't like the word synergistic, I hate it, but I think we're influencing each other gently and supporting each other around something that we all take pride in this and we all want something to happen and we're very open to flexibility about how it should happen. Many things are gonna change in the next two, three, four years. Many, many things, many impacts. There's a new trail that's apparently gonna open in September up on East Main up through, up toward uh, the Little Liberia area, which said September, what the Trust for Public Land told us about. I'm very eager to see what exactly that means. Um, everyone is, everyone's circling, but I find the focus seems rather, uh, I think the focus, the, the simultaneous focus, as one of the fellow from the Parks Department said, he thinks that this, these conversations have been a spark. And because it's a spark, other people have said, hey, it's possible. And well, when you, when you come to the NAOP uh, uh, symposia, we always have uh, folks who have good provocative questions. So here's one talking about Olmsted's design theory. And obviously we know he was not uh, a lover of uh, lots of flowers and floral displays. He was very much more into um, the soothing design. And so how would you address that concern in the context of Olmsted's original plan? And also the question about health signs and school uh, and children's activities, uh, would they not typically be in a school playground rather than an Olmsted park? So, so two questions for you. I'll try the first one, Nancy, you're gonna get the second. second. So, so uh, when we were trying to figure out what else other than trees could be here, and we started figuring out the modern thinking about pollinators, um, now Olmsted was not, that was not present. So I called up Lauren Meyer, the, um, you know, who works with Charles on the, on the major books and said, I can't find understory. She said, oh, come on. She said, I can understory, but they had elaborate understory, but they saved it for their private estates. And as public parks, he was a little bit more reluctant. 
he did use shrubs, but he was a little bit reluctant. So she said, it'd be very interesting if and when something like this goes forward. She said, she said, I will get you some of those lists of some of the low lying, even coastal um, estates that had some things that can be floodable. Um, I know Didi, you and I talked about this. Olmsted wasn't a man who liked a lot of color. We know that, of color and flowers and so on. But the textural and the shadow and shade are certainly there. So I was very interested by that conversation. And I thought, we want to be very wary of whatever happens here to be sure that it's respectful of everything that we're saying. At the same time, we want it to survive. And it's very clear that um, the, the city parks also, uh, and we know this, some of the rest of us know this in our other lives, we don't want to have stuff that goes in and it all gets mowed down one day, you know, they take paradise and put up a parking lot. So we want to be very careful and I keep using the word curate, but I'll use it again. So I think we, we're going to research that further. I'm going to reach back out to Lauren and say, what do you think? I might ask Lucy Lawless the same question. What do you think of this? You know, if we use grasses and such, what do you think of this? Is this, how does this work? And we will, there'll be many more conversations as this proceeds, however it's going to proceed. And here's from, here's from Christopher. Um, I've heard that Seaside had little in the way of understory so that breezes can flow freely. Any confirmation for that? I have no direct con confirmation of that, but I certainly, on a day like today, I think that's probably, <laughs> that, anec that an anecdote is probably true. And we know that breeze was everything. Mm -hmm. And breeze was everything, um, especially in the, in the crowded part of the new burgeoning Bridgeport, I mean that we know that from the story of public parks in London too, the lungs of London, the public parks. So I think you're absolutely right. And there's breezes coming off the water. And if you've been at Seaside at different hours of the day, which we have, the breezes are very different. Um, but we're keeping away from down on the water's edge. You know, that's gonna be, that's part of another story, another time and dealing with the, the sea currents. We're keeping to the uplands and I think more empirical, uh, hanging out up there, Christopher, and you can join us if you want. Let's, let's look at that. I think, it's, I think it's the same question, but in a different way. Breezes were an asset. I said it's one of the three major assets. Breezy Point is spectacular, even today. I wish I'd gone there today. Um, so I think it's a very, um, but I can't, I can't confirm it. I've, we've been searching for primary sources on all of this. And as I said, there's lots of secondary sources, many charming, and much seemingly not true. But um, I'd love it if we could find more primary sources. Thank you. Nancy. And I, I think also, Barbara, wasn't it that part of the understory is low enough so that it won't really impact the breezes? That's that's one of the reasons that we well, kept things that's at a the low theory. Level. That's the theory. Botanists looking at this say, hey guys, some of these look a little tall to us. So I think that I think it would be fair to say the list is going to be skillfully edited and researched and we will assess. The main thing is we don't, we don't want to plant a lawn. We want to have some other layering that is maintainable, does let breezes, yes please, if we can, and does meet our modern thinking about places for birds, places for pollinators. And we're trying out some ground covers right now. I'm very excited to see ask, uh, Wendy keeps talking about Aster, Mr. Eric Coides. And it's supposed to be some really beautiful white ground cover that doesn't stays low and does all kinds of good stuff. So it's, as always, it's a work in progress. And could you address just briefly the issue of the water? And obviously, it's a continuing challenge. You have the um, you have the wall there, thanks to Colonel Ville. Um, and what is the city, and, and what are those who are thinking about this space? thinking about that, because that's clearly not going to go away. Uh, you mentioned some stormwater management. Yeah. Um, I'm curious a little bit more about that and how that plays into this plan. I, I wish I could tell you what will happen with the continuous seawall. I think the uh, resilient Bridgeport in phase one is at the other corner, and they're about 60% of phase one. They're not looking at the seawall per se. One of the issues with the seawall is it's either too low or too high. Um, and part of the center of the Waldemere Lowlands, not the Waldemere Uplands, it is, is almost below sea level. So though there is an active and operational and working drainage, uh, drainage pond there, it's insufficient. So when the water spills over this either too low or too high, high seawall, 
it contains there and then skirts back up. So um, early on, year, a few years ago, when we were dreaming about what you could do. You know, we had a dream. Could you take down the seawall between Park um, and Arniston um, and make the, the, the roads come in on either side of that and let the sea come back in in a very modern 21st century way um, and find a way for the ebb and flow of the sea to be an asset um, using using uh, a genus of place, take, take something very negative and make it into something positive. Let it come in and let it come out in, in a sophisticated engineered way that would remove that bowl. And I, that may not be um, in the next many years, but I'm hoping someday that will be considered because I think we need the, um, the future, the Colonel VA, Vealy times three of the future to figure it out. But it, it, as the, as the 1982 register said, it was a marvel of 19th century engineering. And when I, I underlined said, are you kidding? It was a marvel that was really, has not stood the test of time with our storms. Let's be honest here. And, you know, it's tension to tension. It's not doing what's planned for. But let's hope that there's a vision. It's, you know, one baby step at a time, Didi. But I, I think it's very clear that something, something, something has to happen to the water's edge that's not lining up boulders. Well, I want to thank both of you. And I, I want to just echo a very interesting comment in the chat box, which is, I think, the discussion that we've started this evening. And I'm sure we will continue from now until the end of the bicentennial and well after it. And that really is the question of how we adapt Olmstead Parks for changing social conditions urban settings and climate change. And obviously there are many parties in many cities that are grappling with these issues. And this questioner rightly asks, I mean, are there best practices? Uh, can the academic landscape architecture community uh, provide us help in showing what's working in various places and what's not? And I think it's a very good question, a very good comment and something that we really uh, as we go into the bicentennial, we'll be working hard to uh, translate uh, through National Association for Olmsted Parks and Olmsted 200 so that we can all benefit from reimagining going on across the country. So I want to say thank you for everyone who has come tonight. I want to give you a heads up that we will have a, another conversation with Olmsted on July 20th. We will be uh, interviewing three Olmsted Park leaders from Seattle, Louisville, and Prospect Park, uh, and really exploring with them uh, Olmsted Parks 150 plus years later, how they're adapting and how they're addressing many of the kinds of changes that we've been talking about tonight. So again, I want to say thank you to everyone, and we will see you again soon. Uh, please go back to the Olmsted 200 uh, calendar and watch for uh, activities and our ever-changing blog. And thank you and good night. Thank you.